Hey everybody, I'm back. Okay, I'm gonna read chapter 16 and this is gonna be the last chapter for this week. I'm gonna save the two really big chapters, the two most important chapters in this book for next week and the end of this story. So here's the last one for this week. It's chapter 16, it's called The Grave Diggers. They were two days finding their way to Shirt Tail Camp. They followed the South Fork of the American River into the winding Coloma Valley. The summer hills were now red and yellow. They passed within 10 feet of old Cap Sutter's sawmill. Remember, Sutter's sawmill, where gold was found. Jack heard everyone in the diggings refer to Sutter as Old Cap, and he knew that the miners' yarns about the saw sawmill. He looked at it now, a rough timbered shack on stilts at the water's edge. Old Cap had hired a carpenter named Jim Marshall to build it, and that was the way the yarn began. On a chill January morning in 19, 1848, the carpenter spied a yellow glitter in the trail race. He thought it might be fool's gold until he beat it with a rock, and that was the test. Fool's gold was brittle and would splinter into pieces. Real gold was soft and would flatten out. The lump flattened out just like a yellow button. Marshall ru rushed off to Sacramento where Old Cap had built a fort and arrived in the pouring rain with the news. He made Old Cap bolt the door, pulled a white cotton rag from his pocket of his wet pantaloons and revealed the discovery. Jim Marshall was so excited that he could barely speak. The two men tried, their, tried other tests on it. They got bowls of water and a scale. Using an equal amount of silver, they weighed the two metals under water and the gold was heavier. Then they tested the samples with acid to see if they could corrode it. They wouldn't. There was no longer any question about Marshall's discovery in the trail race. He had found gold. The news leaked out and fast. The rush for yellow treasure began and squatters came swarming into the valley and now a town had sprung up on both sides of the river. Jack had never seen so many long toms and rockers in his life. Is this the way to Shirt Tail Camp? Praiseworthy asked a miner standing knee deep in water and mud. Just follow the river. If you hurry, you might get there in time for a hanging. A lot of boys is taking the day off for this festivities. Praiseworthy just shrugged. We're in no hurry, my partner and I. Well, that dentist fella, they caught him trying to run off with a stolen horse, said the guy. Praiseworthy and Jack exchanged a quick glance. The map. Only cut eye Higgins knew where Dr. Buckby's gold bonanza might be. He couldn't talk very well from a hanging from a limb. Well, he deserved it, no doubt, but he still couldn't talk. On second thought, said Praiseworthy, we're in a terrible hur hurry. Good day to you, sir. Good day. They arrived at Shirttail Camp in an hour. It was a dusty village of round tents and square tents and plank shacks roofed with pine boughs. There, said Jack, screaming, there he is. I'm going to show you this picture as I'm reading. There's old Cut Eye Higgins on a horse with a noose around his neck. He saw Cut Eye Higgins seated on a horse underneath the limb of a tree. He wore his jippa joppa hat and around his neck there was a noose. The scar across his eye set his face at a hard squint. The crowd was ringed around him. We're just in time, Jack muttered. Praiseworthy whipped out Stubbs' red bandana, blindfold and quickly tied around Jack's face. Partner, you got a toothache. What, said Jack? Moan. Now good and loud, come on. Jack gulped and followed Praiseworthy through the crowd. A paunchy man with a curly fringe of whiskers from ear to ear seemed to be in charge of these festivities. Doc, he was saying, you know the verdict of the jury, and as justice of the peace of shirt tail camp, I'll see you get a good bearing as benefits of a professional man, just as yourself. But we don't mind so much that you extracted a gold pouch every time we open our mouths. There's plenty of yeller around and that you light-fingered every pocket watch in town and that nobody knows what time it is anymore. You're a professional man and we tried to make allowances. But horse stealing? That is a heinous, heinous crime and you got to pay the penalty. Since you said your last words two, three times already this afternoon, let's get on to it. Boys, let's switch that horse. Hold on, hold on, yelled Praiseworthy, stepping forward. I got a lad here, lad here with a powerful toothache. The Justice of the Peace threw down his hat. God dung darn it, said the man. And third time today, I am never going to get him hung. I beg you of you gents, said Praiseworthy. We've come a long way and it'll only take a moment to get this tooth out. The boy is in a lot of pain. Just listen to him moan. 
Oh, said Jack as he bellowed, as he held his hand to his cheek. Oh, now he wasn't really pretending because he was downright scared that they might, that they might let Cut Eye Higgins pull one of his own teeth. All right, all right, said the chin whiskered official. Get the doc down off the horse. Hear him give him back his forceps and bring that molasses barrel for the boys to sit on. Jack moaned again, ho, oh, oh, and watched the men help Cut Eye Higgins off that saddle. He seemed a little weak in the knees. They cut the rope binding his wrists together and from his back and left the noose, though, around his neck. He peered to Jack, then to Praiseworthy, and it was a moment before he recognized the butler in the red shirt, Jack boots, and whiskers. I never thought I'd be glad to see you two again, he said. His face was pale, paler than usual, and the sneer was gone. Reluctantly, Jack seated himself on that molasses barrel, and the doomed man clapped an eye on him. You open your mouth, son, and stop squirming. Jack took one look at those feet, steel forceps in Cut Eye Higgins' shaky hand and decided that a team of mules wasn't going to let his mouth open. Let's see those ivories, Cut Eye Higgins said under his breath. I'll just tinker. You didn't come to me to have one yanked for real. We came for the map, Praiseworthy muttered to him. Oh, I figured, he said. Get me out of this and the map is yours. Praiseworthy nodded. It's a bargain. I'll do the best I can, but first, the map. I don't trust you even with a noose around your neck. Cut Eye Higgins lifted off his jippa joppa hat and fished a thick folded strip of brown paper out of the sweat band. It was as if he kept it there to make his hat fit better. When he returned the hat to his head, it slipped down almost to his ears. There's my part of the bargain, he said. Now you keep yours. Open them, boy. Open them jaws, boy. Jack swallowed very hard and he opened up his mouth just a tiny bit so that he could look in there. The crowd watched and the crowd waited. Cut Eye Higgins wiped the forceps on his sleeve and set to work, putting him in Jack's mouth. Praiseworthy opened up the folds of the brown paper, studied the markings, and within seconds, he saw that that foxy scoundrel had outfoxed him again. The map traced a line along the North Fork of the American River, through the Coloma Valley, and ended with an X mark that it was only at Shirt Tail Camp. Why, this map is no good, snapped Praiseworthy. I didn't say it was a good map, Cut Eye Higgins said, except to make my hat fit. But that's the map Dr. Buck B's brother gave him before he died. The same, the genuine article. Only in the meantime, them pockets of gold got discovered all over and over and over again. By the time I got here, there were a hundred miners on this spot. Jack moaned as best he could with the forceps, trying to spread his teeth apart. The 50-50 share of Dr. Buck B's mine was now worthless. Cut Eye Higgins had let them, led them on a wild goose chase. Get me out of this noose, said Cut Eye Higgins. That was our bargain, wasn't it? Praiseworthy ripped up the map to bits. He'd given his word, but he had to stand by it. Gentlemen, he said, turning to the justice of the peace and others grouped around him. I take it you have acted as judge and jury on this case, he said. <laughs> That's right, said the official. He got a fair trial, and anyways, he was caught red-handed stealing that horse. Was he represented by counsel, said Praiseworthy. What for? We knew he was guilty. Under the law, if you intend to dispatch Doc Higgins from the limb of that tree, he needs to be represented. Why, everybody here knows that horse stealing is against the law. What law? Now listen here, stranger. There ain't a law book within 50 miles of what I know of. I hear they got one over in Growlsburg, but it was printed on thin paper and the boys took to rolling cigarettes with it. Speaking for myself, I don't see any reason to let law interfere with justice around here. We never did that before. Praiseworthy began pacing slowly back and forth. In the absence of a book of law, gentlemen, I recommend that you notice that humanity is also lacking in this case. You're about to string up the only dentist in these diggings. Is that human? He may deserve his fate, but what of the innocent, only the crime to come down with a toothache? Praiseworthy turned and made a grand courtroom gesture towards Jack, like my young partner here. Think of the pain and suffering that you will inflict on those in dire need of a tooth extractor. Tomorrow it may be up to you, sir, with your cheek all swelled up like a melon. Or you, sir, Mr. Justice of the Peace, with a pain in your jaw, as if you had a bee for a molar stinging you all night and all day. 
One by one, he singled out all the gentlemen of the jury, and one by one, they found themselves rubbing their jaws as if they could feel a toothache coming on. Praiseworthy had never made a speech like this in his life, but the words rolled right off his tongue, and he could feel their effect on the crowd. When he finished, he was greeted with a yell of approval. He's talking sense, that man, someone called out. The doc can't pull teeth from six feet under, someone else said. We could just put him in jail, said someone else. The justice of Shirt Tail Camp shook his head. Boys, we ain't got a jail. You know that. The verdict was string them up, and I suppose I could delay sentence, though, until another tooth extractor shows up in these parts. There's bound to be one before long. Then he'll get his sentence. There was a general approval from the crowd, and two toothaches broke out there on the spot. Praiseworthy was astonished by the power that he found in his own voice. The two miners got in line at the molasses barrel, and Jack was glad to give up his place. My toothache can't stop hurting, said one man to Cut-Eye Higgins, and he gave the he gave him a wink with his bad eye. Doc Higgins said the justice of the peace, you got yourself a temporary reprieve. When you finish with them extracted jobs, you will stand still and we're going to build a jailhouse right there around you. We'll be, there'll be visiting hours for anyone with a toothache, but I'll see you hung yet and as soon as I possibly can. Then he turned to Praiseworthy. Stranger, I promised the doc a good baron be fit in a professional man. Might as well get all the readiness. Since you appointed yourself counsel for the defense, you get up into those hills and you dig him his resting place. Make it six feet deep. Do you understand? Why six feet, said Praiseworthy. Don't be cantankerous or I'll fine you for being contempt of court, said the guy. Everybody knows a grave has to be six feet deep. Now get going and start digging. The two partners returned to their burrow and led him into the hills above the diggings. You sure made a good speech, Jack said to Praiseworthy. It was something to hear. A regular lawyer couldn't have done better. And you saved Cut-Eye Higgins from being strung up and hung. It's just temporary, which is all about he, what he deserves. They chose a spot big enough, a half mile from camp, and it was on a bluff covered with oat straw and overlooking the river. A very nice spot for a burial. They pulled pick and shovel from Stubbs' pack and ropes, and they set to work digging. Fine-looking country, isn't it? Praiseworthy muttered, even just to be buried in. Jack tried not to think about Boston. It would soon be time to start back, and all they had to show for their labors was a worthless map. Poor Aunt Arabella, he thought. They would lose the house for sure. The entire trip to California was beginning to look like a wild goose chase. When they got the hole four feet deep, they couldn't go any further because they hit bedrock and they struck gold. All right, so next week will be the two big chapters that are the ending of this book. Really good. Don't miss out and I will see you soon. I miss you all. Stay safe.